Hello my guys, gals and non-binary pals and welcome to a new video here on Dan Fatals. My name is Alicia, my pronouns are she, they and this video is one of the companions of our latest video essay Poshagand. We are looking at another creature of Julian Fellows, the originator of Downton Abbey, and how Poshaganda, based on the other side of the pond, is still white Poshaganda. But before we get into it, let me quickly thank our Patreons and invite those of you who can afford it to maybe consider joining in. As you know, we are a very small channel, we're not even monetized, we don't quite do stuff that would be algorithm friendly anyway, so any help and support that we get through Patreon or the one-off donations on Coffee is what allow us to even spend time doing these videos, make research for this channel. So again, if you can afford it, if you are in a safe position, Patreon is an amazing way to support our work, otherwise they're coffee for a one-off donation. Now, let's get on to the Gilded Age. New York is a collection of villages. The old have been in charge since before the revolution, until the new people invaded. Well, I'm new, I've only just arrived. You are my niece and you belong to old New York. George Russell is a power in the land. Before long, he'll put money into his pocket with every train ticket you buy. I think we should know the Russell family. We do not move in the same circles. Mama, you are incorrigible. I take that as the highest praise. I mean, everybody has been looking at what happened at the latest Met Gala, which was based on Gilded Glamour and Gilded Age, Gilded Glamour. They both refer fundamentally to the late 1900s, where the Gilded Age, so-called, so defined by Mark Twain, refers to that era, especially in New York, where new people became rich, usually through manufacturing, transportation, and uh, they became extremely rich, not necessarily with pedigree, but uh, that's why gilded, which I learned myself, means coated thinly by a thin veil of gold, hence today. And I wouldn't exclude that the point of being coated by gold but not being made of gold is also something that defines the nouveau riche that are indeed filled with money, but not necessarily with the, the necessary pedigree, either anciency of their name or actual titles, as we saw they had here in Britain. Beside the Met Gala, Julian Fellow's current TV show on HBO is actually indeed called The Gilded Age, and it's literally basically Downton Abbey transported to a rich era of the US. I get to target more the US market, which I guess pays also better than whatever is paid by ITV. And interestingly, it just can write through stereotypes. You can literally see that the way that he expects his ingenue to be and what the criticism to the higher class would be, he has no depth and no understanding and he shows so much. And the issue with the stuff that Julian Fellows does, as we saw very much in depth in Poshaganda, is that it's literally just coated with all this beauty that we see in costumes, in set design, but really, they're not great stories, they're not very well told, and they're just relying on the riches and the glamour of all the looks so fancy and nice. The entire existence, I suppose, of Julian Fellows is based on glamour. The idea of giving this image of high and fashionable and interesting just because you're not close enough to be able to tell the king is naked, fundamentally. This story is so unoriginal, actually, that uh, Fellows has barely cared about changing names. The story of the Gilded Age is actually based uh, literally on what happened between the Astors, which is an antique family of New York, as antique as they can be, because, guys, 1700s you got independence, let's remember, so it's not can be that antique, but anyway. The opposition between the antique families of New York and the nouveau riche that have just become rich in the 1800s, and so they seek access to society as much as they've got access to wealth now. And the old society tries to avoid it because, oh, just that wealth is vulgar, which is incredibly ironic because the entirety of the high society of New York at the time, we're talking about 1880s, wasn't quite based on anything 
actually hereditary, but try to bring the hereditariness of titles that they left behind in the old continent, in Britain. So it's very bizarre. It's actually historically accurate in that sense. So he actually brings uh, the Astors in. Carolyn Astor is actually a character in the show itself. Her second in command, Ward McAllister, a character in the show, is actually an historical character. I'm not exactly sure why he decided that uh, the Russells would be called as such because they are clearly the Vanderbilts. They even mention the Vanderbilts, but the kind of uh, opposition and competition that they establish between the riches of the Russells and the refusal of society to let them in literally copycats step by step what happened to the Vanderbilts. So much so that I'm actually here with receipts. Shall we get into it? I think we shall. The expansion of industry in the late 19th century and the growth of the American economy created for the first time new fortunes without parallel. The men who accumulated them saw themselves as emergent new elite and they craved acknowledgement. Sounds familiar yet? Because they had neither heritage nor breeding to draw on, they set about winning this by fashioning a lifestyle of great ostentation. Now here's the fun part about, this is historical facts by the way, it's still part of Glamour, wonderful book that I started reading but I hadn't quite finished reading for Poshaganda and it was impressive to me how many points relevant then to Poshaganda and the practical application of it in history it covers. So we're just gonna follow Stephen Gandalf's research and if I could understand the story in four pages of this, Julian really didn't make much of an effort in trying to come up with an original story, original characters, uh, any way of making them talk that is not literally what we know from history. Well done, Julian. Renewed for a second season already. I have a suspicion. I know what's gonna happen. Do you wanna know what's gonna happen? I think by the end of this video, I'll basically spoil to you what's likely gonna happen in season two, if it's gonna follow the story of the Astor and Vanderbilts, which it has so far, so realistic. What is the actual story, you might wonder? I'm glad you asked. Much of the public interest in the new rich derived from their highly publicized battles to gain access to high society. They found that gaining admittance was by no means straightforward. The established elite, which was made up of families whose wealth had been accumulated two generations previously, modeled itself on European court society and granted itself prerogatives that were hereditary. Again, bizarrely, the, the Boston Tea Party, the emancipation from Britain, was the emancipation from the king, from aristocracy. Everybody could be their own man. The idea of land of freedom and possibilities and opportunities, but it's handy if we can find a way to uphold some kind of privilege still. It's impossible, I think, when somebody finds himself in a position of privilege compared to the masses, that they're not gonna try to make a rule and uphold it. In this case, their families just got there first. Let's make being old New York the value here. Even if we don't have more wealth, we are not actually nobles, but let's make the right to be in this society hereditary on no basis other than our grandparents were pilgrims. The forms taken by the upper class life were developed precisely in order to guarantee the preeminence of this restricted group that was commonly referred to as the 400, the number of people who supposedly could fit into the ballroom of Caroline Astor, wife of William Astor, who occupied the pinnacle of New York high society between the 1870s and the 1890s. Again, Julian didn't make an effort here. Caroline Astor is depicted as the pinnacle of New York society in the Gilded Age as well. It's actually a character, it's been casted, it has her daughter. It is also as a character, her social ringmaster, Ward McAllister. It was she who, with the aid of her social ringmaster, Ward McAllister, determined who got in and who did not. The Vanderbilts, for example, whose fortune was based on railroad expansion, sounds familiar, 
spoiler, that's exactly the Russell's point. The Russell story is that George Russell is a robber baron of uh, the transportation and uh, train lines. The Vanderbilts were long regarded as too uncouth to be admitted, even though Cornelius, the Commodore Vanderbilt, at the time of his death in 1877, was the richest man in America. Fair enough, we don't have the previous generation here. We are told that George Russell is actually the one who made the fortune in railroad and transportation. And again, I think the Vanderbilts are even mentioned by the Russells which is even more problematic because, Julian, make an effort here. You cannot just make the same, literally exactly the same storyline that happened with the Vanderbilts just happen again. Change, change the subject. Oh, the Russells made money in something else that it's not railroads because exactly like it's shown, railroads were sort of a monopoly. So not, not even that effort, Julian, you could do. Not even that, huh. The case of the Vanderbilts showed that social progress was a complex matter. Even after the Commodore's demise, his handsome and more polished son, William K. Vanderbilt, aka George Russell, faced obstacles. Despite installing themselves in a huge and dazzling house on Fifth Avenue, not even the fantasy of changing that, and winning invitations to some events, he and his wife Alva, or Berta, remained outside the coral elite. To rectify this, Alva waged a concerted campaign that culminated in March 1883 with what would become known as the Vanderbilt Bowl by inviting 1,600 members of the elite and succeeding in making this housewarming event the social occasion of the season. She created the necessary pressure to cause Mrs. Astor's resistance to crumble. I mean, I have a theory on why, in the case of the Gilded Age, the excuse is the daughter of uh, Alva, sorry, Berta, the, the young daughter of the Russells. And it's exactly because there is a story that is going to come, and I'm sure it will be shown in season two, about something that actually happened with Alva and Consuelo Vanderbilt, which is the real-life equivalent of Gladys Russell. In their search for embellishment and recognition, the rich travelled to Europe, notably France and Great Britain, countries in which wealth was blended with institutionalised social privilege. Some came because they had been shunned by the American elite, others because they admired England's true aristocracy. A hundred years from American independence and we learned nothing about how bad is privilege by birth. If anything, if it's convenient for us, we'll uphold it. Astors, I'm looking at you. William Waldorf Astor turned his back on vulgar America in 1890 and set up home in England. In simplest word, Astor got so mad that he had to concede and accept people like the Vanderbilts that he pulled a tantrum and in Gammon style decided, oh no, I can't deal with this, let me move to England where they actually see the value of history. They don't, they see the value of titles. It doesn't quite matter what you've done, you're coming from America, they're looking you up and down even more. But congratulations to actually have managed to put yourself in the same position to be shunned the way that you did with the Vanderbilts. Vanderbilt. The emphasis shifted as the plutocrats introduced a sharpened element of competitiveness into upper-class lifestyle, as they used luxury to overcome social barriers. The influx of wealth, and in particular of American wealth, into British high society had the added disadvantage of intensifying competition within the aristocratic marriage market. The naked ostentation of wealth led to denunciations of cash power and money dominance, with particular hostility being reserved for the displacement of older standards by vulgar ostentation and greed. What did I tell you? The British will remind you what your place is when you think that coming here with money is gonna be good enough. In here you need to be titled. The irony of Astor being at the pinnacle of New York society by ancient not by title or anything, ancient was all that could matter in New York in the 1880s. And he was like, no, 
I don't want these new people that have made money just as I have just a hundred years before because my grandparents got here earlier. I'll go to England where they know what being of value means. Yes, exactly, to have a title. You didn't have it, Astor, you will be looked up and down. Congratulations for falling down the food chain by choice. <laughs> Wealth and leisure were displayed in order to establish gentility and civilization. Women were the prime vehicle of this, since the duties of vicarious leisure and consumption had devolved to them. Thus, a daughter who conformed to prevailing ladylike standards of appearance and deportment was a valuable asset. One thing that is incredibly interesting is uh, at the beginning of uh, the previous chapter, I mentioned it, I think, in the other video about Bridgeton, there is a point of the entirety of uh, the leisure, the balls in Bridgeton, the marriage market, the deputants, is uh, made pass uh, as if it was all up to the queen and the women. And that is actually true because the women weren't allowed much in society back in the 1800s, so all that they had power over, which was the marriage market, organizing leisure and balls, that kind of thing, you can bet that they would exercise their power over. It's the only thing that they can do. I don't blame them. Unfortunately, because there's this limitation put on women, you keep on limiting them and uh, there's gonna be a lot of repressed anger that comes out uh, the sides. Part of this unexpressed anger comes out in inside competition. So the idea of putting a woman against the other, I guess I told you that we're gonna do a video essay on not like the other girls, the queen bee syndrome, the pick me's, all of this comes out of the limitation that have been given to women. And when you give them a small and small and smaller area to govern over, then anyone that is in that area feels like a threat already because the limitations are already such that you need to watch your back for not having the little that you already have be taken away from you. And that's how the patriarchy distracts us with inner competition between women rather than turning around and say maybe it's not right that we just care about the marriage market and balls. Maybe we should be in parliament too. <gasps> what I'm thinking. Anyway, it's interesting to see this kind of competition that basically they imposed on women. Moving on through classes now, the entire concept of the nouveau riche going back to England and trying to ostentate their value and worrying about how much wealth they need to have to be relevant in the marriage market. Yeah, welcome. What a great idea it was, wasn't it? No single woman embodied the role of the golden heiress more than Consuelo Vanderbilt, the daughter of Willie and Alva, who, at the age of 18, married the 9th Duke of Marlborough in New York in November 1895. And this is the spoiler of what's gonna happen in season two. I'm, I'm quite convinced, if not with an English duke, it's gonna be with the son of Van Rijn, because clearly he sees the value in the money of uh, the Vanderbilt, sorry, the Russells, but uh, clearly he won't be interested, because Julian Fellows decided that since he can write gay characters so well, not, he's gonna write this character gay as well. I think something that really impressed both me and Raven when I was trying to watch The Gilded Age was how immediately this character, when he's revealed to be gay, we were like, mm, that's not, that's, that's not how it works. Um, Fellows, again, as I said at the beginning, writes by stereotypes. The kind of thing that you hear the most in the media about the description of what gay people are, of what an ingenue is, of what the wide accepted criticism of capitalism, of nobility is, it just takes that. It doesn't do any critical thinking. It doesn't try to understand or know the characters and the kind of people that they are based upon it just gets away with writing stereotypes because the set design team and the costume team is actually gonna do all the hard work to make his stuff look pretty enough that it looks like escapism to people. And to that point, understanding the ephemeralness and inexistence actually of glamour, it's fundamental to not let this kind of show distract us from 
the issues and realizing that this story is a known story and all the story that is in uh, the Gilded Age he is actually just taken from history. He might have been better off just admitting this is historical fact and these are the Vanderbilts. But Julian can do that. Julian likes to be incensed too much. He has this tendency, as we saw, of kissing the ground where the nobles here in the UK walk. And uh, I have the feeling, and it's just a feeling, I can't do claims, I've never met the man, nor I care for that. But I have this feeling that whatever he is doing to humble himself towards uh, people like uh, the Earl of Carnarvon, who actually owns the place where Downton Abbey is filmed. The same kind of uh, devotion and dedication and humbleness that he shows to nobles, he expects anyone normal, just normal born, to show to him because now he's a life peer. Now he's the genius behind uh, Downton Abbey, behind the Gidal Age. So I have a suspicion that make it pass, uh, changing one name of one family and make it pass uh, like his own creation is part of the process where he thinks that this will incense him uh, rather than simply admitting, oh, this is all historical stuff uh, and I'm not even writing it with characters and dialogue that well. Hmm. Anyway, the interesting point about Consuelo Vanderbilt, that is actually Gladys Russell, he will show us in the next season, likely, this uh, unhappy marriage that will come, will be avoided, we don't know, now this is fiction, where, based in reality, actually, based in history, will have a lot of influence and, uh, and Gladys will be forced in a direction or the other by her mother Berta, exactly like it happened for Alva Vanderbilt with her daughter Consuelo, to the point that it was admitted years later when Consuelo seeked to actually have a divorce from the Duke of Marlborough, and one of the reasons why she could get the divorce was her mother admitting in court that she pressured and coerced her daughter into the wedding. And this is likely spoiler for the second season of The Gilded Age. Although the American rich were viewed with more sympathy than those of other countries, there was always some envious resentment of their lives of privilege. On the envy point, I will send you to the ending of Poshaganda, where we discussed that I have no doubt that at the time, and you know what, most people actually watching stuff like Danton Abbey and the Gilded Age, or the Kardashians, or Emily in Paris, or Villanelle in Killing Eve, or all her outfits, yes, I have no doubt that most of the entertainment and the escapism is actually partially being envious of all that beauty, all that wealth that can buy you that beauty, but that is a distraction and I wish people would have more of a grasp of that. And that's the reason why I'm making these videos and I'm glad that I have a chance to actually bring them into reality, not only with Downton Abbey, which was what the entire first video say on Poshaganda was based upon, but with the analysis of Bridgeton last week, with this one of the Gilded Age now, because the point is not envy, is this kind of social divide shouldn't exist. Considering how poorly off we are, here in the UK especially, but from what I hear of the US, it's insane. The US doesn't have healthcare paid by taxes. They don't have workers' rights to off days like we have here. Like, I hear about the US and I am worried about, oh my god, should we consider ourselves lucky, as bad as we are here? And we have, again, 14 to 16 percent of people living under the line of poverty. We're talking about working people. So, it's, it's problematic to me that all this shows most people are just uh, looking at the glitz and glam. There is so much more and it's worth critiquing if you ask me, and I hope that this video did that. If you found it interesting, if you had any other idea, if you are thinking of any other show that I might not have mentioned so far, by all means, leave me a comment, let's talk about it. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching this. If, again, you have time, way, and inclination, and you are in a safe position to do so, maybe check out Patreon, see if what we do there is interesting to you. Again, it's a very democratic and socialist way to do Patreon. It's not that you quite have exclusives there. You have the full script, so fair enough, but you have the subtitles for 
any kind of scripted video that we do anyway. There is not quite something that is not freely available. It's just literally, if you can help us, that's the way to do it so that our content can get to you and can get to anyone who cannot actually afford it. So if you can join Patreon thinking, basically we've paid it forward for anyone else that can just watch us for free on YouTube for anything else, thank you so very much. I'm Alicia and I will see you at the next video.